are learning, all of us. Now to the session contents of this session is about leaders leading by example, being the change you want to see. And for that, you need to unlearn old behaviors and relearn those behaviors in a totally new way. And that might be the most difficult thing you do, the unlearning. Have you heard this concept before? Yeah. So we need to unlearn the patterns, the old ways of working that we've been doing for 30, 40 years maybe sometimes, and learn new ways. And of course it's easier for young people who never used to work in a management role or leadership role before. Of course it's easier. Uh, it's much harder for people who just have worked for a very long time. So then it's about the self-awareness. It starts really with self-awareness, uh, with the leaders. Uh, that this will be necessary. Uh, if the awareness is not there, they will not start unlearning and relearning. <coughs> it's obvious. If you're not aware of something, you are, it's an unknown. Unknown, unknown, <laughs> so to speak. So um, self-awareness is a prerequisite, a condition that we need to be able to be the change and unlearn and relearn. So it's by sharing how you learn, how you improve with your teams that will make the difference. Go first, show the way. Uh, learn all the time. Try to improve yourself for all the time. Tell your team about, you know, last week I tried to improve this and that, and this is the result. I didn't do very well, but I hope to change a little bit next week, and then we see how it goes. I will come back with a full report to their team. Yeah. Things like this, just just tell how you're doing with your improvement efforts and learning efforts. And um, the role that we take as leaders and manager, managers is very close to the, uh, the agile coach role or the agile people coach. We have both here. Um, we are kind of expecting you to be a little bit familiar with the agile coaching framework here. This is from Lisa Adkins, uh, who created this framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she says here that a good coach, an agile coach, needs to be able to take different stances. And that's to be a mentor, a facilitator, a trainer, and a coach. And these are different roles that you use depending on the situation, depending on the people, depending on the need. So you go in and out of these roles all of the time when you work as an Agile coach. Are you familiar with the uh, Agile coaching uh, framework? Some of you maybe, uh, some of you maybe not so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah. But um, it's not really that important here because what's important here is the Agile people coach framework that we have, we have, we took the Agile Coach framework from Lisa Atkins and we built upon that because that's how you develop frameworks and, and stuff. You build on something that great that somebody else did. We tweak and we, st we steal and tweak, you're gonna <coughs> feel sense. <laughs> steal and tweak, steal with pride because that's how you develop something even further. So we did that and we came up with the Agile people uh, framework instead. Now I just wanted to go through the stances a little bit. <coughs> yes, exactly. <clears throat> if we talk about facilitation, I, I will talk a little bit about the differences between the different stances here. So facilitation is really when you probably don't have any knowledge about the topic at all. You have a group of people and you are going to help them through the process to reach the desired result in the end. It could be that you are facilitating a workshop, for example. That's a very good example because it's, it's a certain time, it's maybe a one day workshop, and you have a predefined goal that you have defined in advance or together with the group in the beginning of the workshop. So what you are doing is that you are helping by your facilitation skills and facilitation tools for the group to reach that goal that you have decided about. 
And you do that without intervening into the topic at hand. You can be a total uh, idiot when it comes to the actual topic that they are discussing. You're just making sure that everybody's voice is heard, that the process of uh, getting along and coming to conclusions and decisions is smooth, smooth so that uh, you go step by step towards the desired outcome. That's facilitation. So it's a very low level of obtrusiveness. <laughs> now that's a difficult word to translate. I appreciate that, obtrusiveness. I don't even know the Swedish word for that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I understand what it means, okay? So you intervene very little into the, the area, the subject, the topic. Okay, very low level. Then we have professional coaching. Here, your best friend uh, uh, are the questions. The questions, you ask questions. You guide the person to come, uh, or the group for that matter, it could be a group or a team or a person, uh, to, to come up with uh, the desired answers or proposals for, uh, to those questions by themselves. Even if you yourself maybe have some experience in that area, you don't immediately share that experience. But you let the person themselves create a new solution that fits their purpose and their situation. So that's the professional coach. You help people to reach results by asking questions. Um, so that's a little bit more obtrusive, let's say. And it's, uh, we focus here more on the process of getting to the answer or the outcome or the result here. Now, if we move across the line to content, the next level is teaching. And when we teach, we believe that our teacher or, um, uh, yeah, the teacher, let's say, has more knowledge than the group or the person. So I teach something that you didn't know before um, when you're a teacher. Uh, so you're not asking so many questions, maybe you have exercises or discussions, but, but the, the teacher has knowledge that you don't yet have. So you, you give some, some new knowledge to people in, uh, in, a, in a formal setting. And that's a bit more obtrusive. So you're intervening uh, into, and you're telling people, this is the way it is, blah, blah. This is m my experience. Maybe I draw from my, from my own experience, and I also tell you, this is the way this thing works, OK? Or could work. And then mentoring is the most uh, intrusive uh, way of working for an agile coach. Because in mentoring, you don't only ask questions and tell people how it is, but you also share your own experiences and give advice to the person. You say, I think you should do like this. That's the mentor. Because the mentor many times is a senior person who probably worked in the, a similar role as the mentee did, and they have experience of the same situations, and that's why I can give advice about, I think you should do like this, or I think you should do like that. Based on my experience, that would work the best. So you are kind of driving the person more. You're deciding more for the person. The more obtrusive, the more you affect directly the person. So that's the difference between the four stances. Nesse livro que vocês receberam, eu escrevi o prefácio, e foi sobre isso. Então, exatamente essa imagem vocês vão ver no livro. A gente teve uma discussão na, durante uma turma, porque a aluna não concordava que o coaching era intrusivo. But, é, e eu expliquei, porque a gente tem um certo nível de intrusão, porque você tem que conhecer um pouco do mundo da pessoa. E o prefácio é sobre isso, ela me inspirou a escrever esse prefácio. Uh -huh. <laughs> para ir Good. um pouco mais a fundo no assunto hoje à noite, ó, então não for dormir tá pra ler <laughs> 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 
Yeah, good. Thank you, Tiago. Um, now we come to the Agile People Coach. And in the Agile People Coach uh, framework, we added some more roles than those four stances. Uh, first and foremost, you can come to become a good Agile People Coach. You probably come from uh, HR. Maybe you come from uh, people, people leading position. Uh, maybe you come from leadership. You've been a manager or leader for a long time in, in a company. You've been leading different kinds of groups and so on, or worked in production or manufacturing or finance or legal or whatever you've done. Um, or you can have been a master of agile. That means that you know a lot about lean and agility uh, in general. Maybe complexity theory, maybe, uh, you know, yeah, maybe you're a scrum master, maybe you're a previous agile coach, uh, or something like this. So you can come from three different um, previous roles when you become an agile people coach. It's a, this is a senior role. Uh, you could say, because you need life experience as well. Uh, ideally, you should also be a parent, because this, is, this will teach you a lot about <laughs> life and leadership, actually. This is a very good school to be a parent, having children. And maybe you had your own company for some time. Maybe you had some ups and downs. Maybe you went bankrupt in your own company. That is also a very good experience. You've been in different roles, in different companies for many years, maybe. So the more experience you have, the more ready you are to step into this quite senior role, I would say. An agile people coach should have experience from life and work. Mm -hmm. It's not a junior, uh, it's not a junior role. Yes. É, só para poder contribuir com o assunto, eu uh, é, pretendo migrar ou pretendo me aperfeiçoar do Agile Coach para o Agile People Coach. É, e nas experiências anteriores por onde passei com a agilidade, sendo um Scrum Master, sendo uma agilista, as, a, a, os cuidados com pessoas sempre estiveram presentes. Na verdade, assim... Acho que é o que fez de mim diferente e é o que me fez seguir essa trilha de pessoas, né? Porque de agilidade há um campo enorme de exploração e de estudo. Mas eu fiz uma, tomei uma decisão de ir mais para este lado. Primeiro porque eu já tenho quase 50 anos e eu tenho experiência de vida bastante para compartilhar, não para ensinar, mas para compartilhar. E esse é um lugar importante que eu acho que, é, é, que eu fugi por muito tempo. Né? Porque eu fazia tão naturalmente que quando alguém falou assim, oh, agora é tua responsabilidade, você é líder, faça. Faça como responsabilidade de crachá, de cargo. Eu falei, ah, não quero, não quero, não quero, eu sou especialista, eu quero falar de agilidade. Não, eu quero ajudar as pessoas a falarem sobre isso, a argumentarem sobre isso, a propor soluções para problemas. Né? Eu quero que elas cresçam, para que eu possa crescer, não tem outro jeito de fazer isso. Então. Eu escolhi por esse caminho, estou fazendo essa migração, estou tentando essa migração, porque para mim não tem outra maneira de ajudar só pela agilidade, tem que ser pelas pessoas. Né? Thanks for sharing that. I'm very happy to hear that yeah, you decided this. <laughs> It's close to my heart. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you come from being a leader, agile master, maybe in your case, uh, or a nature professional. Maybe you worked in, in many of these three roles. And you, of course, use the agile coaches tools. You, are, you use the training role, the, the mentor role, the coach role, and facilitating role. But we also added three more roles or skills or competence. You could call it skills, competencies, or roles, really. And that's the navigator. The navigator, except for agile and lean knowledge, you also have deep knowledge in systems theory and complexity theory and understand Kenevin by Dave Snowden and the different domains and things like this, network theory and, and so on. Um, that's the navigator. <laughs> the best description or metaphor for a navigator is probably on a ship. 
somebody who is navigating the ship by looking at the stars to avoid, you know, the, the islands and the rocks beneath the water. And uh, they are very skilled at avoiding the, the rocks and kind of navigating through the waters um, using different tools to do that. And then we have the, um, the guide. The guide may be an expert in a certain area. So let's say if you are, have been in HR for many years, you may be a, a recruiting expert, or maybe you're an expert in learning and development, or um, workforce planning, or whatever HR area you could be an expert in. Or you may find yourself being an expert in a certain production process or manufacturing area. If you've been a leader there or worked as an engineer for many years in a certain area, it's like a travel guide. I know something about this place and I can take people on a journey and tell them about this place more, about the history, about places to visit, about you know, entertainment or whatever is to know about that place. Uh, so that's the guide that you could also take as a role here when you have specialist knowledge in a certain area. But, and I say could take this role because not all people may, may be able or want to take that role. The important thing is not that you are able to take all of the roles here. The important thing is that your attitude is towards learning and improving and covering a greater bit of this, this uh, map, let's say. Uh, the last role that might be the most important of all here is the reflective observer. Okay, so many times when a new manager enters a new uh, company, that manager wants to put his or her footprint. That means that they start very quickly to reorganize and come with their own ideas. This is the way we should uh, do it. Everything that the old manager did was crap. You know, they throw away everything and do something new because now I come with a solution to the big problem and I have the solution by reorganizing and by fixing uh, everything that was wrong before and so on. No, that's not what you, you should be doing. If you're a smart person and you're coming to a new company, you should just start by observing. Talking to people, observing, reflecting, thinking, take your time before you jump in and do something big. And this is exactly what the reflective observer is doing. For example, you can step into the reflective observer role when you have a high performing team or a high performing organization, because then you are not needed that much as a leader. You can step out of the system and observe. And when something happens in the system that requires your attention, then you, you, you make your choice. Which of the roles should I now use when I step into the system again? And then you say, okay, maybe I'm a teacher, maybe, maybe they need to learn something here, maybe I'm a, I'm a facilitator, maybe I should be an observer, uh, coach or whatever. So, um, so then you have a, a whole palette of different, or in Sweden we call it smörgåsbord, <laughs> uh, of, of different tools and skills and roles to choose from, depending on what the situation is, what people are involved, and what is the, the potential problem here. So that's the reflective observer. It's a good role to step into when you feel unsure of what to do. You can also experiment and try one of the roles, and if it fails, you can try another role. But maybe sometimes it's better to step out and just observe. Take it slow, take it easy, reflect, observe. If it's not chaos, then you need to act quickly. Okay, but we, we don't think it's chaos now, but we think it's quite okay. <laughs> So it's to, to be 
the person that is needed by the team, the, the, the department, or the company, depending on what level you work on. You can work on different levels. Maybe you have a very big responsibility. Maybe you have just one team. You can use these roles regardless on what level you work on. Bruce, you talk about this, be water. Be water, be the water. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's how you kind of blend in and, mm -hmm. and see what's needed. So what's the difference then between um, an Agile coach and an Agile people coach? I have two, two pictures to illustrate that. There is one with those just a second. We have more focus on people, obviously. Uh, humans are at the core of how we think, when, whereas uh, with an Agile coach, it's the processes that are the most important. And then um, processes are still important, but not as important as people. And um, we have also, the third one is the product, and then we have tech. So at the end of this session, we are going to do an exercise where we look at the difference between an agile coach and an agile people coach, just to exemplify a bit more. But we'll wait with that, uh, that exercise. Uh, then we also have, uh, oh, what else do we have? We have choose a role depending on the need. Mm -hmm. You can go to that one. Yeah, I showed this when we were talking about it. Yeah, roles, so okay, yeah, so you have it, right. exactly. Good, and we skip that. And we go to an exercise. Now you are being given 12 different scenarios. And uh, in your group of four, probably four persons, or maybe five in one case, uh, you're going to discuss these scenarios. And you can start from 12, or you can start from number one. And you don't have to cover all of them. You can cover the ones that you think look interesting. OK, let's cover three, six, and nine. Or let's do one to 12, very shallow. Well, let's do just one very deep, okay? So we think about the scenarios. You decide, you self-organize in the group and decide which scenarios are interesting, which ones should we focus on. And then you say, in what role could I make myself useful if I look at the agile people uh, roles here or the competency in the agile people coach? Uh, Yeah, that's right. Vocês vão na página 17, tem os, os cenários, e eu vou deixar aqui na tela o framework para vocês consultarem. Thank you. Thank you.